Good evening and welcome, and thank you very much for coming tonight. This is the second talk in a series that we're putting together, trying to make an offering to our HCHC community, but even more so to our church at large. So what you're going to hear tonight is a talk by Father Theodore Dorrance on healthy leadership, leadership. But this is the second talk. Last night, we heard a talk about what is a healthy church and how you assess a healthy church. And these are the first two talks in a series of talks that we're putting together as an offering to the church at large, trying to give ongoing education to the leaders of our church, to the clergy, to the lay leaders. And we're gonna be dealing with different topics that we think are relevant, practical, and helpful to our church communities growing, growing healthy, and living out their calling as the church. This is a series that's being put together by the Archdiocesan, the Greek Archdiocese Department of Stewardship, Outreach, and Mission, in conjunction with Father Theodore Dorrance, is the director for the department in the D metropolis of Denver, their Department of Church Health and Evangelism. Also, we're working with the department, the San Francisco Metropolis Department of Evangelism and Mission, together with the Mission Institute here at Holy Cross. So we've been working together as an ad hoc committee, coming up with this idea of what we can offer to the church at large. And so we want to welcome you to the second talk, Father Theodore Dorrance, who is the director, as I mentioned, He's the former pastor of St. John the Divine Greek Orthodox Church in Beaverton, Oregon, which he started with six families and built up to a very vibrant, dynamic church with over 150 families, and um, he served there for 20 years. So he has a lot to offer on the practical side, a lot to offer in the theological and the, the, uh, the theoretical side. So we want to welcome him and thank all of you for coming and thank him for being with us. Thank you, Father Luke. Father Luke and I go all the way back to uh, seminary. Uh, I think when I was in my last year, you were in your second year. Is that about right? I think two years difference. And uh, we uh, did prison ministry together. We played basketball together. We studied together. But even more than that, uh, we shared a common mindset and understanding of the church for ourselves and for the whole world. So it's great to be back at Holy Cross and Hellenic College, and it's uh, great to be able to be in front of you talking about leadership in the Orthodox Church, and almost everything that I say will be about leadership for both clergy and laity in a parish setting. And I'm really hoping that uh, I can break this down into four mostly equal parts, looking at leadership uh, in terms of why is it, is it important now what is leadership? How is leadership part of a parish family system? And looking at the leader uh, as a person. A little bit about my own background. Uh, I've been a parish priest for 27 years. Almost all of that was in the metropolis of San Francisco. When I graduated from the seminary in 1990, my own metropolis, or then Diocese of Denver, did not have a bishop. And so I was recruited out to the West Coast. And I spent two years as an assistant in Oakland, California at the Ascension Cathedral, four years on my own as a Preuss Dominos at St. Catherine in Redondo Beach, California, and then, as Father Luke said, started a parish from scratch up in the west side of Portland, Oregon, and spent 20 years there, and then felt called not to just help one parish, but to actually uh, try to help as many parishes as possible. Uh, while I was in the metropolis of San Francisco, uh, I spent 15 years on the metropolis uh, council of that, of that metropolis, 25 years uh, on the missions and evangelism ministry and about 12 years as its director. The difference between what I was doing then and what I'm doing now, now it's full-time. Then I was a full-time parish priest and I was doing that as a volunteer. And when I actually wrote or had the team with me write the strategic plan under the metropolis of San Francisco for that ministry, it became 
extremely clear that it needed to be a full-time position. And uh, so I really couldn't do that. That's how Tomaida Hudanish got hired for that. And she is still the director full-time of that ministry. And then I was able to come to the metropolis of Denver and uh, start the, the Office of Parish Health and Church Growth, focusing on the health of parishes and the growth of orthodoxy, the planting of parishes and working pan-Orthodox with all the different jurisdictions to grow orthodoxy, particularly here in North America and specifically in the United States. I'm also earning my doctorate in leadership, and uh, I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm talking to you today on leadership. So let's look at part one. Why is leadership vital now? Here are some Greek archdiocese trends. Church membership is declining. Church sacraments are declining. Church contributions are declining. Church member spirituality is declining. Church stewardship is declining. Church disengagement by members is increasing. One way we know that is because we have a shrinking core in so many of our parishes and an expanding periphery. Volunteerism is extremely hard to get the larger the parish you have. And what happens to those people out there further on the concentric circles of periphery is they drop away and they become uh, de-churched past Orthodox Christians. Church member deaths are increasing and church dependence on festivals and fundraising with outsiders for our own operating budgets is increasing. So the trends in the archdiocese as a whole show that we are not healthy, that we are not trending in the right way. And this speaks for the need of greater and greater trained leaders, whether they be clergy or whether they be laity. Let's look at some U.S. societal trends. Many of these, the first two for sure, have to do with more Protestant churches. But as you know, what often is happening to Protestant churches also is happening to some degree with Orthodox churches because we're dipped into the same societal milieu. Over 100,000 churches right now are in decline in the United States on their way to perhaps being closed. Over 3,000 churches a year are closing down. The fastest growing segment, as we know, in our U.S. population, religiously speaking, are those who put in the category of religious affiliation, none, N-O-N-E, the nuns. Among the nuns, the, the fastest growing segment are those who have never, ever in their life been churched. I want you to pause and think about the ramifications of that. One of the reasons why I said what I said in the chapel is that unchurched people are not necessarily seeking. They are not looking to come and check your church out. They have no compelling reason to cross the threshold of our churches. It doesn't matter how well we preach or teach, how beautiful our architecture is, how beautiful our services are, the singing, the greeting, how organized we are, how serious about it we are. It doesn't matter because, I, I should say it doesn't matter because they're not coming to see it. It does matter. But this is a new reality for us in the 21st century. Society is fast becoming either de-churched or unchurched. As I said in our own churches, the periphery is expanding and the core is shrinking. And it all points to the fact that we're living in a post-Christian society, personally, individually speaking, and a post-Christendom society, where even the institutions and the corporate mindset is post-Christian. Our country is a mission field. It is ripe for harvest, waiting for people like you to go out into that harvest and reap it. But we don't just need managers who look at the status quo and manage it. We need leaders who are thinking creatively, adaptively, 
because the reality out there demands it. So I want to look at two central definitions that come right out of our uniform parish regulations. One looks at the definition of the mission and purpose of every one of our parishes. And the other looks at what it means definitionally to be a member in good standing. And the reason why I want us to look at that is we need to ask ourselves the question, do we only believe these definitions or are we actually living them out? This is our conviction and our confession, but do we function this way? Remember, this is the part where we are trying to understand why we need leadership. So the first definition is, what is the purpose and mission of every parish according to the UPRs, the Uniform Parish Regulations? Number one, to be the local Eucharistic community. Do you know that 20% of the parishes in the metropolis Denver do not have priests? So we believe that the purpose and the mission of a parish is to be a Eucharistic community. Can you be a Eucharistic community without a priest? No, you cannot. So we believe it, but we don't function according to it. To keep, practice, and proclaim the Orthodox Christian faith pure and undefiled. To sanctify the faithful through God's grace in worship, the divine liturgy, and other sacraments. Of course we believe this, but do we function according to this? To proclaim and teach the gospel, adding faithful to the church through instruction, baptism, and chrismation. to establish educational and philanthropic activities to foster the above aims and to sanctify parishioners in the faith. Let's look at the individual member in good standing. To apply the tenets of the Orthodox faith to his or her life, all of them, not picking and choosing. To faithfully attend the divine liturgy and other services every Sunday, not once, twice, three times a month. To participate regularly in all of the sacraments. If you were to go to a typical Greek Orthodox parish and you were to survey and get an honest answer about how many of the members actually participate regularly in confession, I don't think that we would like the answer. To respect all ecclesiastical authority to be obedient in matters of the faith, practice, ecclesiastical order, to contribute time, talents, treasure toward the progress of the church's sacred mission, to be an effective witness and example of the Orthodox faith to all people. We believe these, but we don't necessarily function. Why? Because if our focus is to just keep the status quo, but not to lead people and inspire them and influence them towards change and growth so that we raise the bar and invite people to more accurately live according to our definitions, if we, are, if we do that, we risk what? Resistance, conflict, even sabotage. There are four basic challenges. There could be more. I just toss these out for your uh, review. To parish health. Number one, we often do not function as we believe, as I just made the point with the previous two slides. There is a general widespread ignorance among our membership of our Orthodox faith that leads to personal identity crisis, and parish identity crisis. We have a great need, parish to parish, in every metropolis across the archdiocese for parish revitalization based on an understanding of a parish's core theological values, of their mission, and of their vision. Every parish could do a strategic plan 
as an effort and a step towards revitalization. But what does it take? Courageous leadership toward necessary change so that we can express the unchangeable. In the book, Canoeing the Mountains, by Todd Bolsinger, and if you haven't read this book, it is a must read, okay? He takes the core of discovery of Lewis and Clark and he uses it as a, as a metaphor throughout his book. He says that Lewis and Clark took all of the knowledge that they had in terms of mapping, in terms of experiential understanding of the United States. They knew the eastern half, and they thought they could assume, based on the expertise that was available to them, about the western half. And we know that the mission of the Corps of Discovery was to use canoes and flow from east to west to the Continental Divide, carry their canoes a little ways, and catch what they thought would be the Columbia River and ride it from the Continental Divide to the Pacific Ocean, finding a waterway from the east coast to the west coast. They climbed up the headwaters of the Missouri River, and this is what they saw. Looming in front of them were the Rocky Mountains, a mountain range unlike anything they had ever seen. That's why the title of the book is Canoeing the Mountains. They could not canoe the Rocky Mountains. They had to ditch the canoes, ditch the maps, ditch their understanding of the western half of the United States, which was wrong. They had to go off the map into uncharted territory. This is one of the reasons why they got the French trapper and his wife, Sacagawea because they needed to adapt or die. Adapt or totally abandon their mission. <laughs> I'm using this because I think that we're in very many ways in a similar situation. The 21st century in the United States for us as Orthodox Christians, not because of orthodoxy, but because of the society in which we are called to minister to and to preach to and to bring the gospel to is uncharted territory, and it's increasingly so. And we are going to need to adapt or decline. We're not going to abandon the mission. What does uncharted territory for us mean? That the world in front of us is nothing like the world behind us. In uncharted territory, adaptation is necessary for the mission of our parishes to succeed. Everybody must change and grow. That means repent. Personal transformation is a must, especially for leaders, clergy and laity alike. Now, I don't want to scare you by talking about change especially Orthodox, because we don't like change. So we must meet, first determine what will never, ever change, and that's our holy tradition. So don't think that Father Theodore is talking about changing or adapting holy tradition. This is our core identity and our core mission. This is truly sacred and essential. Our core values and our convictions and our beliefs are based on holy tradition and it cannot change. But as I said before, we need to figure out what does need to change in order to express that unchangeable, our holy tradition. We have put slowly but surely in our way many obstacles to fully expressing holy tradition. And it is going to take leadership to bring about that change. So what needs to change? We need to change from being inward-looking communities to missional churches. We need a commitment to actually live what we believe. We need to shift from maintaining the status quo to growing personally and as a church, more towards the likeness of God in obedience 
to what he handed to the apostles from generation to generation to us. A shift from ignorance to understanding. A shift in our priorities. The Orthodox Christian faith and the church and our relationship with God cannot just be a part of our life. We have to cease compartmentalizing and we need to make it central. What is leadership? First of all, leadership is not management. And I am not here saying that management is not absolutely necessary, vital, and important. But it is not, leadership is not management. Management is about planning, budgeting, organizing, staffing, monitoring, problem solving, knowing that we have a ministry and we need to make it work. Do leaders ideally make good managers? Absolutely. It would be a perfect world if every leader was also a great manager and every great manager was a great leader. But they're not exactly the same. Without demeaning management, it is maintaining. It is not shifting direction. It's not shifting vision. It's not adapting to new challenges that cannot be necessarily satisfied in a linear way by the technical expertise that you have in front of you or around you. Leadership is about change and growth. It's about establishing direction, developing a vision for the future, strategizing to meet that vision, focusing on growth and adaptation, repentance. The first words of John the Baptist and the first words of Jesus Christ were repent. Change your mindset. Change your spiritual understanding. Grow. Motivating and inspiring necessary change toward Christ's likeness and Orthodox Christian health is the job of leaders. Now here is a humble definition of leadership, and I broke it out in bullet form so it's easier for us to take it step by step. Leadership is a learned skill. Yes, it combines a person's God-given gifts. There are people that have different gifts, and that makes them more this or that as a person innately. But leadership itself is something that can be learned and cultivated and improved. Not everybody's going to have the same charisma. Not everybody's going to be naturally as good with people as the next. Not everybody's going to be of the same intellectual capability. Not everybody's going to have the same logistical or organizational abilities. But leadership can be learned. We take what God has given us, and with ongoing study, with hard work, with synergy and cooperation, we become better. We need to keep growing, and we need to work hard at preparing ourselves for every situation that God is calling us to. First bulleted point of the definition. Leaders are also both servants and stewards. The perfect leader in all of the humankind is Jesus Christ. So he defines servant leadership. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But leaders are also stewards. The, the Greek word for steward is ekonomos. It means that you are the ruler of the household. But the qualifier is that the household is not yours. You are managing and cultivating and responsible for someone else's household. Leaders are stewards because all that we are and all that we have in our possession is not really totally our own. It comes from God and we're accountable back to Him. The church is not our own. The ministries are not our own. The mysteries are not our own. Time and gifts are not our own. But we are responsible stewards of them, and we will be held accountable to God for them. And so leadership encompasses that. 
Leadership is a relationship. A relationship between you and the faithful of your church community. Relationships are two-way. And we'll talk more about that. It is more than managing the status quo. As sure as I'm standing before you, whether on videotape or live, if we as the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese continue to manage the status quo, we will surely decline and our parishes will increasingly become in crisis mode. Those that are already in decline will go on life support. The pressures of the society are too great. We need to be leaders, not managers of the status quo. Leadership is about intentionally initiating necessary change to accomplish the church's mission. What are the obstacles? What are the challenges? Where do we need to change in order to truly express God's will and his holy tradition as we have received it? Leadership is using influence rather than coercion. And I have a whole slide dedicated to this beautiful short quote from Jesus to his disciples. Mark 10, verses 42 through 45. Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So please, my dear brothers and sisters, do not ever think of leadership in a parish context in any different way than what you see exemplified and modeled by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Take this verse and memorize it. And ask yourself, in every situation, am I violating someone's freedom? Am I diminishing their personhood? Am I lording it over them? Am I exercising authority over them? Or am I a servant who is willing to give my life up for them. Jesus is the model leader. He humbled himself and became obedient to death. He came not to be served, but to serve. He was willing to enter into conflict. Just look at his relationship with the Pharisees. He didn't unhealthily seek it out, but he didn't avoid it. I'm convinced that there is a subliminal message often given to clergy especially, that if you encounter conflict in your parish ministry, you are failing. You have to please everybody. How diabolic and wrong is that? If those of you who are married tell me if there is an absolute absence of conflict in your marital relationships. So much comes out of that. So much is in, it's so important. Jesus was courageous in the face of danger. Just look at his dialogue with his father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, take this cup from me, but not my will be done, yours. He fulfilled the old covenant and he ushered in the new covenant. Jesus was all about change, and it was hard for people. He adapted the truth to new realities, new wine in new wineskins. Jesus inspired, influenced, modeled, empowered, and equipped others. Greater things shall you do if you ask me in my name. The church is built on the foundation of of the apostles. He sent them out. He didn't do everything himself. And in each generation, he sends each of us out to be leaders in his name, to follow and imitate him. 
Jesus did not lord it over others or ever violate people's freedom. So this brings us to part three. Leadership isn't ever in isolation. You can't have a leader who looks behind him and there are no followers. Leadership is a part of a family parish system. And here I really lean on Edwin Friedman, and this is an awesome book. It's called A Failure of Nerve, and the subtitle is Leadership in the Age of the Quick Fix. It's not an easy read. He wrote two-thirds of it before he died, and then the last third at the bequest of his wife was was finished posthumously by some of his colleagues. But he has a lot where he hits it right on the nail. One of his, he is a disciple of Dr. Murray Bowen, who in the 50s, 60s, and 70s really, really took family systems theory. He was a, he was a, a, a therapist of families. But he used to look at the symptom bearer and try to treat the symptom bearer. And he noticed that when the symptom bearer was in the context of his or her family, the dynamic changed radically. And he realized, I don't need to treat the symptom bearer, I need to treat the system. And it radically changed psychology and even some of psychiatry. Uh, from his day forward, and Edwin Friedman is certainly a student of that family systems theory. So here's some, here's some bullet points that have to do with this theory and how it affects us as leaders in a parish family system. Every parish is a family system, basic. A parish's challenges and problems are located in the system, not just in the nature of its individual members. A focus on symptoms alone, whether it be individual symptoms or even parish symptoms, or on a dysfunctional member in isolation from the rest of the body is misleading. Every parish family seeks to maintain a balance or a status quo called equilibrium or homeostasis. And therefore, the system resists change, and therefore, it will resist leadership and leaders. The more unhealthy a parish or an organization or even a nation is, the more anxious and chronically anxious it is even if the members don't realize it. And Edwin Friedman, in his book, takes great lengths to actually say that the United States, from his day at the end of the 20th century into the 21st century, is a chronically anxious system. And every chronically anxious system manifests or expresses these five characteristics. And I want to go over them in detail because I want you to ask yourself, do you see these characteristics in your own parish family system? And what does it mean for you as a leader? Number one, reactivity. Number two, the tendency to herd together. Number three, displacement of blame. Number four, a quick fix mentality. And number five, the absence of healthy leadership. Because in the face of the first four, who wants to stand in front and put a bullseye on their chest? So let's look at the expressions or the characteristics of reactivity. Making or taking things personally, easily offended. Feelings are confused with opinions. Argumentative behavior. A lack of objectivity or calmness and perspective. Resistance of any well-defined stance or leader. A focus on the latest, most immediate crisis. An atmosphere of seriousness and a disappearance of playfulness. It's interesting that Joe last night said that the absence of playfulness is a sign of an unhealthy parish. 
He must have read Edward Freeman. The herd instinct. Emotional fusion with others. In other words, stuck togetherness in an unhealthy way. A desire for good feelings rather than progress. Dissent is discouraged. If you are a leader in a chronically anxious system and the herd instinct is in place, it's not a safe place to state your opinion, especially if it's not the popular opinion. Peace is valued over progress, comfort over anything new, and safety over adventure. If Lewis and Clark had been thinking safety first, they would not have ditched their canoes and learned how to ride horses. They would not have ventured to cross the Rockies in the fall, knowing that they could probably die during the winter. The herd instinct values rights over responsibility. A community that has this expression is willing to appease troublemakers and sabotage the strong and the healthy. Have you ever been to a general assembly where dysfunction rules the day? Somebody gets up and states their opinion with an emotional uh, expression and everybody focuses on that and it derails the general assembly and you're totally off topic and it's hard to get back. We want to appease troublemakers and sabotage the strong and the healthy, and we're willing to lose leaders to protect the immature. Displacement of blame. Blaming rather than owning. You will always know a leader because the leader blames no one. You positions rather than I positions. A focus on dysfunction rather than on strength and function. Adaptation to immaturity. It's a focus on the leader rather than one's own response to the situation. And it's a tendency to reject responsibility. When we go before God on Judgment Day, we will not be able to blame Him, and we will not be able to blame others. Then and only then, maybe perfectly, will we understand what it means to be responsible. But it's much better to start now. The last one is quick fix mentality. Impatience and outward focus. We would rather focus on the sliver in our neighbor's eye rather than the plank in our own eye, to use Jesus' words. Quick fix mentality says that problems are fixed linearly with technique and technical solutions. Okay, that didn't exist for Lewis and Clark, and it probably doesn't exist in a very clean way for us as we look at the 21st century here in the United States. It's a desire to escape challenge. It's an oversimplistic view of life. It's people who have a low threshold for pain and discomfort. Of all people, this should not be true of us as Orthodox. We live an ascetic life of self-denial if we are living what we believe. We practice this week in and week out, actually day in and day out, if we employ the spiritual practice of watchfulness and unceasing prayer, remembrance of God. We should not have a low threshold for pain. The witness of an Orthodox in the United States should be so palpable if we just live what we believe. Focus on symptom relief, not fundamental core issues and changing those core issues. A desire for certainty and easy answers. An avoidance of the struggles that go with growth. The struggles that go with repentance the struggles that go with change. So this leads us to part four, the leader. Let's take a look at poor and unhealthy leadership for just a second. Again, thinking in family systems theory lingo. 
Leaders who are unhealthy lack the emotional distance and boundaries to think out their vision clearly. Remember the tendency to get stuck together in an unhealthy way, to get sucked back into the system. Unhealthy or poor leaders are led here and there by crisis after crisis. They're more firemen than they are visionary leaders. Leaders are reluctant to take well-defined stands, to be clear about what is true, what is healthy, what is right, what should be the path. Family systems theory says that a leader in the system who is becoming healthier and healthier, more mature, more whole as a human being, can actually lead the whole system towards health and function if they stay the course. Leaders who lack the maturity and sense of self to deal with conflict, with resistance, and with sabotage. In the 21st century, my dear brothers and sisters, without exception, leaders will be resisted and you will deal with sabotage. It comes with the territory by definition. If you are doing your job as an Orthodox Christian leader, whether you are clergy or lay leader, you will be resisted. Stay the course. What is healthy leadership? The capacity to separate oneself from surrounding emotional processes, in other words, anxiety, anger, gossip, threats, blame, etc., you don't need to enter into that emotional process. You can stay connected and love the person or the people without entering into that anxiety and that dysfunction. As a matter of fact, it makes sense if there's someone in quicksand and you don't jump in to save them. But you stay on the edge on solid ground and you, you stay out of the quicksand in order to save the person in the quicksand. S similar analogy. The capacity to obtain clarity about one's own principles and vision based on the truth, on health, and on holy tradition. The willingness to be exposed and vulnerable. To not be afraid to make mistakes. Remember the spirit of safety versus adventure. You're going to make mistakes. Just don't make them twice. You'll keep making mistakes. Just don't keep making the same ones. Persistence in the face of inertial resistance. Not initial resistance, inertial resistance. Don't let resistance stop progress towards parish health towards the right vision, towards the right mission, towards growth. Love your people more than you love yourself. Self-regulation in the face of reactive sabotage. We all have buttons. We all have triggers. Learn, understand them. Try to have God heal them. This is what we mean by the healing of the passions. Be continually in the process of transformation so that there are no buttons for people to push. The willingness to stay the course but stay connected to those who are sabotaging you or the mission. I wrote down stay the course, which is courage, and stay connected, which is pastoral. Look at Christ and his ministry. How many times did people try to sabotage his ministry? How many times in his circle and outside of his circle did they try to resist what God had called him to do? Get behind me, Satan, he said to Peter, chief among the apostles. But he stayed the course, and yet he stayed intimately connected with those who were resisting him and even sabotaging him.
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do as he hung on the cross. Almost his final words. We are called to become like God. God has made us in his image. So when we talk about being a well-defined or self-differentiated leader, having a healthy sense of yourself, we're not talking about selfishness. We are talking about being a mature human being growing towards the likeness of God. And that's why Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Not in an unhealthy, sinful way, in a healthy, Christian, God-like way. Leaders are a peaceful, non-anxious presence within a anxious system, family parish system. Be strong and courageous without being controlling or forceful. St. Paul said, be watchful, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong. Let all you do be done in love. We see a lot of really strong leaders out there, but they don't do everything in love. They exercise authority over people. They lord it over people. They have the expectation that they have the power and the authority and you must follow them. This is not Christ-like leadership. This is not a mature, healthy sense of self in the image and likeness of God. Remain centered in prayer. Remain centered in worship. Remain centered in the sacramental life. This is the heart and the soul of the Orthodox Church. You cannot be a leader in it if you are not living it, if it is not transforming you, if you are not benefiting from the fruit of the life. And I quote here from St. Nicodemus or St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain. There is no virtue that is either higher or more necessary than sacred prayer. Sacred prayer and it alone unites. It alone joins man with God and God with man and makes the two one spirit. You want to follow Christ, imitate Christ as the perfect leader. Unite yourself to him in prayer. We need to be people who are continually growing, who are continually repenting, who keep studying, and who learn until our last breath. There is so much that I did not know when I left seminary, and yet I thought I knew everything. I didn't learn that lesson right away as an assistant, but boy, did it hit me in the face when I started going on my own. I realized that I was in a crisis because I had so many blind spots and I had so many weaknesses and there were so many demands and, and things that I needed to know and do better that without reading and studying and attaching myself to mentors and imitating their example and, and not isolating myself, ministry, even in the 20th century, would have been absolutely impossible. How much more so? in the 21st century. And St. Paul says, not that, even St. Paul, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Even in a sense, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on and on and on continually toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Every effective leader, whether they be clergy or lay, that I know is a lifelong repenter, learner, grower, studier, reader, and follows and surrounds him or herself with other leaders, other strong Orthodox Christian models to imitate. A couple last quotes. There is a combination of two qualities which marks true church leaders. Are they humble about their own abilities? And at the same time, can they discern the abilities of others? The most basic task of church leaders is to discern the spiritual gifts 
of all those under their authority and to encourage those gifts to be used to the full benefit of all. Only a person who can discern the gifts of others and can humbly rejoice at the flowering of those gifts is fit to lead the church. We do not push ourselves forward first. We equip and we empower others and we launch them and employ them. Leaders develop and make leaders. Another quote from St. John Chrysostom, every church leader is not first and foremost called to a position, to an office, or to a title, but to God. So the primary responsible responsibility of a church leader is not to issue decrees, but to stir the souls and enliven the conscience, consciences of believers so that they, by their own volition, their own free will, will obey the commandments of God. You cannot change anybody. Your job is to work in relationship with them, to influence, to inspire, but not to, to control. St. John Chrysostom again says, the most important quality of a church leader is knowing right from wrong and having the courage to choose what is right. My dear brothers and sisters, we know what is right and we know what is wrong. We know what is God's will so often, but we don't have the courage to choose and act upon what is right because we know it means conflict. We know that it is the narrow path, that it is the hard way. So we're talking about transformational leadership. Leaders must be courageous. Change is hard and it always represents loss. Leaders will face resistance, but they must stay the course. True leaders are at their best when they are challenged, not when everything is going well. What should our leadership focus be? Personal transformation, not parish struggles. That's dysfunction. You want to focus on strength and health, what is true and what is right. The federal government doesn't train people to detect counterfeit by studying the counterfeit. They train their federal agents to study the real thing over and over and over again so that in a, a blink of an eye they can detect the counterfeit. We need to focus on what needs to be left behind so that the essential mission can succeed. We need to focus as leaders on the mountains ahead, not the rivers behind. And we need to be continually learning and focusing not on what we've already mastered, but where we are weak and what is missing in our life. It needs to be mastered. I love this painting. It's not an icon, but it shows Peter being bid to leave the safety of the boat and to walk on water. As long as he's focused on the face of Christ and he is operating under God's grace and not his own abilities, he is doing what no other human being but the God-man can do. But the moment he focuses on himself, he notices the wind and the waves and he takes his focus off of Christ, he sinks. But there is something else that I love and that we often forget. Only Peter asked to bid the Lord to have him get out of the boat and come on the water. That spirit of adventure, that trust in God, that willingness to even be able to fail are characteristics of a leader. We need to tell our Lord, bid us to get out of the safety of our comfort zone and do what needs to be done for the church in this place, in this time, in uncharted territory, off the map, so that we can adapt, so that we can grow, so that we can remove the obstacles, so that we can make the changes that are necessary to express the unchangeable. And as long as we keep our focus on Christ, we will be able to lead the church effectively in the 21st century. Thank you very much.